gone by. The sun has come up over a thousand times. Summers and winters have cracked the mountains a little bit more, and the rain has brought down some of the dirt. Babies that weren't even here before have already begun talking regular sentences already. And here and there are some people who consider themselves to be quite young and spry that find they can't bound up a flight of stairs anymore quite like they used to. <clears throat> Not without their heart fluttering a little. Yes, all that can happen in a thousand days. But nature has been pushing and contriving in other ways, too. Many of our young people fell in love and got married. Yes, the mountain got bit away another fraction of an inch. A million gallons of water has passed through the mill. And here and there, a, a roof was put up over a new home. You know, almost everybody in the world gets married. You know what I mean? And in our town, there aren't hardly any exceptions. Almost everybody in this world crawls to their grave married. <laughs> now, the first act of this play was called The Daily Life, and this act is called Love and Marriage. As I said, it's three years later. It's, it's July the 7th, 1904. It's just after high school commencement. Now, that's, that's when most of our young people jump up and get married. Right after they passed their last examinations in solid geometry and Cicero's orations, and they suddenly feel themselves fit to be married. Well, it's early morning again. Only this time it's been raining. It's been pouring. It's been thundering. Mrs. Gibbs' garden, Mrs. Webb's there. They're, they're, they're drenched. All those pea vines and bean poles there, they're drenched yesterday. All along Main Street, the rain looked like, like curtains being blown around. I don't know, it could start up again any second. Well, there's the 510 to Boston. Here comes Ms. Webb down to get breakfast. Here comes Ms. Gibbs. Just as if it was another ordinary day. Now, I don't have to tell you women folk in the audience. And these two ladies that you see before you have cooked three meals a day, one of them for 20 years, the other for nearly 40, no summer vacation. They've raised two children apiece, uh, washed, cleaned the house, and they never had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> they never considered themselves hard used either. It's like what one of those Middle West poets once said. You got to love life to have life, and you got to have life to love life, and that's what they call a vicious circle. Yeah, Here comes Howie Newsom and Betsy delivering the morning milk. Here comes Cy Crowell delivering the paper, just like his brother before. Morning, Howie. Morning, Cy. Si. Anything in the paper I ought to know? Nothing, Ma, except for losing about the best baseball pitcher Grover Corners ever had. I reckon he is. And now all he'll be doing is pitching hay. Howdy, to give up a thing like that just to get married. Would you have, Howie? I uh, can't tell, Si. Never had no time up that way. <laughs> Morning, Howie. Hello, Bill. You're up early. Morning, Mr. Warren. Seeing what I can do to prevent a flood. That river's been rising all night. Si Crow here is all broke up about George Gibbs retiring from baseball. That's the way it goes, Si. Back in 84, we had a ball player named a Hank Todd, even George Gibbs couldn't have touched him. Moved down to Maine and became a parson. A wonderful ball player. <laughs> How's the weather look to you, Howie? Oh, ain't bad. I think they're gonna play out for good. Bill? Howie? Morning, Miss Gibbs. Good morning, Howie. It's too bad about the weather. It's been raining so heavy that maybe I'm gonna clear up. We hope it will. How much did you want today? I'm going to have a house full of relations, Howie. I think I'll need three of milk and two of cream. Three of milk? Two of cream. My wife said to tell you hope they'll be happy. No, they will. Thanks a lot, Howie. Tell your wife I hope she can get to the wedding. Well, maybe she can. She'll get there if she can.
Good morning, Miss Well. Oh, good morning, Mr. Newsom. I told you four quarts of milk, but I hope you can spare me another. Yes, sir. And two cream. Will it start raining again, Howie? Well, I was just saying to Miss Gibbs is how it may clear off. Miss Newsom told me it's special to tell you is how we hope they'll be happy, Miss Well. <laughs> no, they will. Thank you. Oh, and thank Miss Newsom for me. And we're counting on seeing you at the church. Yes, Miss Well. We'll get there all right. Couldn't miss that. Come on, Bessie. Well, Ma, day has come. You're losing one of your ticks. <laughs> Frank Gibbs, don't you say another word. I knew I would cry in a minute. <laughs> Every now and then he says, I do to the mirror, but it don't sound very convincing to me. <laughs> I declare, I don't know how I'd get along. Why the rain's just flowing, and seems you at his feet are dry, and he's got warm things on. Well, that's a yarn break. Well, Emily won't think of such things. He'll catch his death in cold within a week. Uh, I remember my wedding morning, Judy. <laughs> never really seen you before. And there I was in the Congregational Church, married a total stranger. And how do you think I felt? Frank, weddings are perfectly awful things. Farces, that's what they are. Here, I made something for you. Why, Julia Hersey, friends told me. Okay, very hard, and I had to do something. <laughs> uh, how'd you sleep last night, Julia? Well, I heard a lot of the hours. Yeah, I get a shock every time I think of George setting out to be a family man. Yeah. Huh? That great gangling thing. I tell you, Julia, there's nothing in the world so terrifying as a son. Why, the relationship between father and son is the damnedest awkward. Well, mother and daughter's no picnic, let me tell you. Well, uh, they'll have lots of troubles, I suppose, but it's none of our business now. Everybody's entitled to their own trouble. I am being mentioned too much you in this world. It ain't natural to be lonely. Julie, you know one of the things I was scared of when I married you? Hold on with you. I was afraid we wouldn't have material for conversation more than last us a couple weeks. <laughs> I was afraid we'd run out and eat our meals in silence. Well, that's a fact. <laughs> Uh, and you and I have been conversing for 20 years now without any noticeable barren spells. Good weather, bad weather. It's very choice. I always find something to say. Did you hear Rebecca stirring around upstairs? Oh, uh, only day of the year Rebecca has been managing everybody's business up there. She's hiding in her room. I get the idea. She's crying. Lord sakes, this has got to stop. Rebecca! Rebecca, come and get your breakfast. Good morning, everybody. Only four more hours to live. <laughs> Where are you going, George Gibbs? Just stepping across the grass to see my girl. You, you put on your rubbers. It's raining tours. You don't go out this house without a girl prepared for it. Oh, my, just a step. Well, you catch your dad the cold and come all through the service. Yard, do as your mother tells you. <laughs> Tomorrow on, you can kill yourself in all weathers. While you're in my house, Leah Plotz, thank you. Perhaps Mrs. Webb is used to call her at 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Here, take a cup of coffee first. Be back in a minute. Good morning, Mother Webb. Good morning, George. Goodness, you frightened me. Oh, now, George, I hate to say it. You can stand there a minute out of the rain, but, but really, you understand, George, I can't ask you in. Why not? George! You know as well as I do that a groom cannot see his bride on his wedding day, not till he sees her in church. Oh, that's just a superstition. Oh, good morning, Mr. Webb. <laughs> morning, God. Mr. Webb, you don't believe in that superstition, do you? Well, there's a lot of common sense and superstition. <laughs> Millions have followed it, George. Now, don't you be the first to fly in the face of custom. How is Emily? Well, I haven't heard a sound out of her. She hasn't waked up yet. Emily's asleep? Well, it's no wonder. We were up till all hours sewing and packing. 
Now, George, I'll tell you what I'll do. You sit down here with Mr. Webb for a minute and drink this cup of coffee, and, and I'll run upstairs and see that she don't come down and surprise you. Now, there's bacon over there, too. But don't you be long about it. morning, a girl's head full of, uh, you know, clothes. <laughs> <laughs> One thing and another. Don't you think that's probably it? I, yes. I never thought of that. Girls have to be a mite nervous on their wedding day. Gee, I wish a person could get married without all that marching up and down. Every man that's ever lived has felt that way, George. <laughs> but it hasn't been any use. <laughs> it's the women folk that have built up weddings, my boy. For a while now, the women have it all their own. A man looks pretty small at a wedding, George. <laughs> all those good women standing shoulder to shoulder, making sure the knots tied in a mighty public way. <laughs> well, you believe in it, don't you, Mr. Webb? Yeah. <coughs> oh, yes, now, don't misunderstand me, George. Marriage is a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing. Now, don't you forget that, George. No, sir. How old were you when you got married, Mr. Webb? Well, you see, I been to college, and I'd taken a little time getting settled, uh, but uh, Mrs. Webb, she wasn't much older than what Emily is. Oh, age hasn't got much to do with George compared with uh, other things. <laughs> what were you going to say, Mr. Webb? <laughs> I don't know. Was I going to say something? <laughs> George, I was remembering the other night the advice my father gave me on my wedding day. Yeah. He said, uh, Charles, he said, uh, start right off showing who's boss. <laughs> Best thing to do is to give an order about something, even if it don't make sense. <laughs> uh, just so she'll learn to obey, he said. And then he said, if anything about her irritation, conversation or anything, get right up and leave the house. <laughs> and that'll make it clear to her. And, uh, oh, yeah. He said, never let your wife know about how much money you have. Never. Well, I couldn't exactly. And so I took the opposite of his advice, and I've been happy ever since. <laughs> so let that be a lesson to you, never to ask advice of anybody on personal matters. George, are you going to raise chickens on your farm? What? Are you raising chickens on your farm? Yes. Uncle Luke's never gone in for chickens much, but I've been figuring on reading up. A book came into the office the other day on the philo system of raising chickens. I wish you'd read it, John. Um, I'm thinking of going into it in a small way myself in the backyard. I'd put an incubator in the cellar. Charles Webb, are you talking about that incubator again? Well, I thought you two would be talking about things worthwhile. Well, my daughter. If you'd like to give the boys some good advice, I'll go upstairs. <laughs> George, Emily has got to come down and eat her breakfast. Now, she sends you her love, but she does not want to lay her eyes on you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Myrtle, I guess you didn't know about that older superstition. What do you mean, Charles? 
since caveman. No bridegroom should see his father-in-law to be on the day of the wedding. <laughs> or near it. Now you remember that. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Webb. I have to interrupt you again. You see, we all want to know how this began, this, this wedding, this plan to spend a lifetime together. I am awfully interested in how big things like this begin. Now, you all know how it is. You're 21 or you're 22. And then you make some decision. And whoosh, you're 70 years old. <laughs> You've been a lawyer for 50 years. And this white-haired lady by your side is eating over 50,000 meals with you. How do big things like this begin? Well, George and Emily are going to show you now the conversation they had when they first discovered, as the old saying goes, that they were meant for each other. But before they do, I want you to remember what it was like when you were very young. Particularly the days when you were first in love. And you were like a person sleepwalking. And, and, and you never quite saw the street you were walking in. You never quite heard everything that was said to you. You were just a little bit crazy. <laughs> now, will you remember that, please? Now, George and Emily will be coming out of the high school at 3 o'clock. George has just been elected president of the senior class. And since this is June, he'll be president of the senior class all next year. And Emily, Emily has just been elected secretary treasurer. Oh, yeah, they're coming out Main Street now. I can't believe I've got to go home. Goodbye. Oh, Emily, can I carry your books home for you? Oh, it isn't far. Excuse me one minute, Emily, will you? Say, Bob, if I'm a little late, start practice and I'll give her some long high ones. Goodbye, Lindsay. Oh, goodbye. <coughs> I'm awful glad you were elected too, Emily. Thank you. Emily, why are you mad at me? I'm not mad at you. You've been treating me so funny lately. Well, since you asked Goodbye, Miss Corcoran. Well, what is it? I don't like the whole change that's come over you in the last year. Now, I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings, but I've just got to tell the truth and shame the devil. A change? <laughs> well, what do you mean? Well, up to a year ago, I used to like you a lot. And I used to watch you while you did everything because we'd been friends so long. And then you began spending all your time at baseball and you never stopped to speak to anyone anymore. Not to really speak. Not even your own family. You didn't. And George, it's a fact that ever since you've been elected captain, you've gotten awful stuck up and conceited. such a thing was happening to me. I guess it's hard for a fella not to have some faults creep into his character. <laughs> I always expect a man to be perfect, and I think he should be. Well, I don't think it's possible to be perfect, Emily. Well, my father is, and as far as I know your father is, there's no reason on earth why you shouldn't be, too. Well, my feel is the other way around, that men aren't naturally good, but girls are. Well, you might as well know right now, George, It's not as easy for a girl to be perfect as a man because, well, we girls are more nervous. <laughs>
Hello, Miss Slocum. Oh, hello, George. Hello, Emily. What do you have? Emily Webb, what are you crying about? Well, she just got an awful scare, Mr. Morgan. That hardware store wagon almost ran over. Everybody says Tom Huggins drives like a crazy man. Well, here, have a good drink of water, Emily. You look all shook up. Yes, I tell you, you got to look both ways before you cross Main Street. Nowadays, it gets worse every year. <laughs> what do you have? I'll have a strawberry phosphate, Mr. Morgan. No, no, have a soda with me, Emily. Two strawberry ice cream sodas, Mr. Morgan. Two strawberry ice cream sodas, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I tell you, there are 225 horses in Grover's Corners this very minute that I'm speaking to you. State inspector came by here yesterday. Now they're going to be bringing in those automobiles. I think the best thing to do is just stay at home. <laughs> I remember a time when dogs could sleep on Main Street all day long and nothing would ever come along to disturb them. There you are. Oh, yes, Mrs. Ellis, I'll be with you in a moment. Now, what did you want? They're so expensive. No, no, don't you think of that, Emily. We're celebrating our election. And then do you know what else I'm celebrating? No. I'm celebrating because I've got a friend who tells me all the things that ought to be told me. Oh, George, please don't think of that. True. No, no, Emily, you stick to it. I'm glad you spoke to me like you did. But you'll see, I'm going to change so quick. You bet I'm going to change. And Emily, I'll, I want to ask you a favor. What? Emily, if I go away to State Agriculture College next year, will you write me a letter once in a while? I certainly will. I certainly will, George. It certainly seems like three years, you'd get out of touch with things. Maybe letters from Grover's Corners wouldn't be so interesting after a while. Grover's Corners isn't a very important place when you think of all New Hampshire. But it's a very nice town. The day wouldn't come when I wouldn't want to know everything about our town. I know that's true, Emily. Well, I'll try to make the letters interesting. You know, Emily, whenever I meet a farmer, I ask him if he thinks it's important to go to agriculture school to be a good farmer. Why, sure. Yeah, and some of them say it's even a waste of time. You get all that stuff anyway from the pamphlets the government sends out. <laughs> Uncle Luke's getting old. He's about ready for me to start taking over the farm tomorrow if I could. Why? Like you say, being gone all that time in other places, meeting other people, well, <coughs> gosh, if a thing like that could happen, I don't want to go away. I guess new people probably aren't any better than old ones. Uh -huh. I bet they almost never are. <laughs> Emily, I feel you're as good a friend as I've got. I don't need to go and meet the people in other towns. Well, George, maybe it's important for you to go and learn all that about cattle judging and soils and those things. Of course, I don't know. Emily, I'm going to make up my mind right now. I won't go. I'll tell Pa about it tonight. <laughs> George, I don't understand why you have to decide right now. It's a whole year away. Emily, I'm glad you spoke to me about that that fault in my character. <laughs> what you said was right. There was one thing wrong in it, and that's where you said I wasn't noticing people. Well, and you, for instance. You said you were watching me when I did everything. Well, I was doing the same about you all the time. Well, sure, I always thought about you as one of the chief people I thought about. <laughs> I always made sure of where you were sitting on the bleachers and who you were with, and for three days now, I've tried to walk home with you, but something always got in the way. Yesterday, I'm standing over by the wall waiting for you, and you walked home with Miss Corcoran. Oh, George! This is life funny. How could I have known that? I Listen, thought... Emily. I'm going to tell you why I'm not going to agriculture college. I think once you've found a person you're very fond of, I mean, a person that's fond of you, too, and likes you well enough to be interested in your character, Well, I think that's just as important as college is, and even more so. That's what I think. I think it's awfully important, too. Emily? Yes, George? <laughs> Emily, if I do improve, make a big change, would you be, I mean, could you be? I am now, and I always have been. So 
I guess this is an important talk we've been having. Yes! Yes! Well, wait just a minute and I'll walk you home. Mr. Morgan, I'll have to go home to get the money to pay you for this. What's that, George Gibbs? Do you mean to tell Listen, me? Mr. Morgan, I have reasons. Uh, Look, here's my gold watch to keep until I get back with the money. <laughs> it's all right, George. You can keep the watch. I'll trust you. I'll be back in five minutes. I'll trust you for ten years, George. George! Not a day over. <laughs> It got all over your shock, Emily? Yes, it was nothing, Mr. Morgan. I'm ready. Now we can get on to the wedding. A lot of things can be said about a wedding. A lot of thoughts go on during a wedding. Now, we can't fit them all into one wedding, naturally, especially not one in Grover's Corners, where most weddings are very short and plain. Now, in this play, I take the part of the minister. So that gives me the right to say some things. From now on, this play is going to get pretty serious. You see, some churches believe that marriage is a sacrament. And I don't quite know what that means, but I can guess. It's like what Ms. Gibbs said a few moments ago. We're supposed to go through life two by two. Well, this is a good wedding. The couple is pretty young, but they come from a good state. They chose right. But the real hero of the scene is not even on the stage. We all know who that is. It's like what uh, one of those European fellows once said. Every time a child is born, it is nature's attempt to create a perfect human being. Well, we've all seen nature pushing and contriving for some time now, and it's obvious that she's interested in quantity. <laughs> but I think, I think she's interested in quality, too. Maybe she's trying to make another good governor for New Hampshire. I know that's what Emily hopes. But let's don't forget all the other witnesses of the wedding. All the ancestors. There are millions of them. And most of them set out to live their lives two by two. Millions of them. That's my sermon. It's not very long, anyway. Ma, you 
say Thursday nights. Emily and I are coming over to dinner every Thursday night. You'll see. Well, Ma, what are you crying for? You look all funny. Come on. I never felt so alone in my whole life. And George over there, I hate him. I wish I were dead. Oh, Papa. Oh. Emily, Emily, now don't get upset. But, Papa, darling, I don't want to get married. Shh, Emily, everything's all right. But, Papa, why can't I stay here for a while just as I am? Uh, no, no, Emily, stop and think of it. But, Papa, don't you remember? And think such things. You're just nervous now, now. Uh, George, George, will you come here a minute? But why, you're marrying the best young fellow in the world. George is a fine fellow. But Papa, I'm giving my daughter away, George. Do you think you can take care of her, Mr. Webb? I want to. I want to try. Emily, I'll do my best. I love you, Emily. I need you. If you love me, help me. All I want is someone to love me. I will try, Emily. Emily, I will try. And I need forever. Do you hear me? Forever and ever. <laughs> This woman to be your lawful wedding. Perfectly lovely wedding. <laughs> Loveliest wedding I ever saw. Oh, I do love a good wedding, don't you? Doesn't she make a lovely bride? Until death do you part. Oh, I do. <laughs> and to you, Emily, take this man to be your lawful I don't know when I've seen <laughs> such a lovely wedding. <laughs> in my day. Do I believe in it? <laughs> yes. I suppose I do. In Mary's Inn, there's millions of them. Then there's the cottage, the go-kart, the Sunday afternoon drives in the Ford, the first rheumatism, the grandchildren, the second rheumatism, the deathbed, the reading of the will. Once in a thousand times, It's interesting. I pronounce you man and wife. second act, folks, uh, but the third act is, is fairly short, so we're just going to go right on. <laughs> this time, nine years has gone by, my friends. 
It's summer of 1913. There are gradual changes in Grover's Corners. Horses are getting rare. Farmers come into town now in Fords. Everybody locks their house doors at night. Ain't been a burglary in town yet, but everybody has heard about it. You'd be surprised, though. On the whole, very little ever changes around here. That's certainly an important part of Grover's Corners. It's on a hill. A windy hill. Lots of sky, lots of clouds. Oftentimes, lots of sun and moon and stars. Now, you come up here on a fine afternoon, and you'll see range on range of hills. Oh, an awful blue they are up by Lake Sunapee, Lake Winnipesaukee. And if you go all the way up, then you can see the White Mountains and Mount Washington, where Conway and North Conway is. Then there's our favorite mountain, Mount Modignac, right here. And around it lies towns like Jaffrey, North Jaffrey, Peterborough, Dublin. Way down in the middle of it is Grover's Corners. Yes, it's a beautiful spot up here. Mountain laurels and lilacs. I often wonder why people would want to be buried in Bro Brooklyn or Woodlawn when they could just as easily pass the same time up here in New Hampshire. Over here are the old stones. 1660 to 1607. Strong-minded people came a long ways to be independent. Now, summer people will come up here and walk around and laugh at the funny words on the stones. That don't do any harm. Genealogists come up from Boston. They're paid by city people for looking up their ancestors. They want to make sure their daughters of the American Revolution are on the Mayflower. Well, I guess that don't do any harm either. Over here are some Civil War graves. Stones have got iron flags on them. They were New Hampshire boys. They had the notion that the Union ought to be kept together. Though they hadn't seen more than 50 miles of it themselves. No, all they knew was a name, my friends. The United States of America. The United States of America. And they went and died. Over here, it's the new part of the cemetery. There's our old friend, Miss Gibbs. Simon Stimson, choir director of the Congregational Church. And here's Mrs. Soames, the one who enjoyed the wedding so much, you remember? A lot of others. Here's editor Webb's boy, Wallace. His appendix burst on a Boy Scout trip to Crawford Notch. A lot of sorrows have been sort of quieted down up here. People just wild with grief brought all their relatives up to this hill. And then times, sunny days, rainy days, snow, you all know how it is. A lot of thoughts come up here, day and night. There ain't no post office. Now, people know a lot of things, but they just don't take them out and look at them very often. We all know that something is eternal. And it ain't houses. It ain't names. It ain't the earth. Well, it ain't even the stars. We all know deep down in our bones that something is eternal and that something has to do with human beings. Now, the greatest people who have ever lived have been telling us this 
for 5,000 years, yet you'd be surprised how many people are always letting go of that fact. There is something that is eternal in all human beings. Now the dead don't stay interested in us living people for very long. They gradually, gradually let go hold of the earth. And all the ambitions they had, and the pleasures they had, the things they suffered, the, the people they loved, they get weaned away. Now that's how I put it. They, they get weaned away. Now they stay while, while the earth part of them burns away. It, it, it burns out. And then they slowly find themselves becoming indifferent to what's going on here in Grover's Corners. They're waiting. They are waiting for something that they feel is coming, something important and great. Now, aren't they waiting for that eternal part of themselves to come out clear? They're going to say some things that will maybe upset you, but that is just how it is. With mother and daughter, husband and wife, enemy and enemy, money and miser, all these these terribly important things somehow just kind of grow pale around here. So then what's left? What's left when your memory is gone? And your identity? Mrs. Smith. Here comes a living person. That's Joe Stoddard, our undertaker. He's come to supervise a new-made grave. And there is Sam Craig. He was a Grover's Corners boy. He left town to go out west. Good afternoon, Joe Stoddard. Good afternoon. Uh, let me see now. Do I know you? I'm Sam Craig. Gracious sakes alive. Of all people, why? I should have known you'd come back for the funeral. It's been a long time, Sam. Yes, I've been away over 12 years. I'm in business out in Buffalo now, Joe. So I was in the East when I got news of my cousin's death, so I thought I'd combine things a little and come back to see the old home. You look well. Oh, yes, I I can't complain. <laughs> it's uh, sad, our journey today, Samuel. Yes. Yes, yes, I, I always like to say I hate to supervise when a young person is taken. Well, they'll, they'll be coming soon. I had to get up here early today. My son's supervising back at the home. My Aunt Julia. I had forgotten that she... Of course. Of course. Yes, yes. Doc Gibbs lost his wife, oh, two, three years ago, about this time, and today's another sad blow for him, too. That's my sister Carrie's boy, Sam. Sam Craig. I'm always uncomfortable when they're around. Simon. Do they pick their own verses much, Joe? No, not usual. Uh, mostly the bereaved pick the verses. Doesn't sound like Aunt Julia. Well, there aren't many of those Hersey sisters left now, I suppose. Let me see. I want to look at my fathers and mothers. Over there with the Craigs, Avenue F. director at church, was he? Drank a lot, he used to say. Nobody was supposed to know. Oh, he'd seen a heap of trouble. Took his own life, you know. Did he? Hung himself in the attic. Oh, everybody tried to hush it up, but of course it got around. Wrote his own epitaph, though. Uh, you can see it right there. Uh, ain't exactly a verse. Why, it's just notes of music. What is it? Oh, uh, I wouldn't know. Uh, Wrote up in the Boston papers at the time. Joe, what's she die of? Who? My cousin. Oh, uh, 
did you know? Had some trouble bringing a baby in the world. It was her second, though. There's a little boy about four years old. Grain's going to be over here. Yes, there ain't much more room over here among the Gibbses, so we're going to open up a whole new Gibbs section over by Avenue B. Oh, you'll have to excuse me now. Gibbs, 
I never realized how troubled and how in the dark my persons are. Just look at him. I loved him so. Morning till night. That's all they are. Troubled. A little cooler than it was. That rain's cooled it off a little. Those northeast winds always do the same thing, don't they? If it ain't a rain, it's a three-day blow. Mother Gibbs, one can go back. One can go back there again into living. I feel it. I know it. Why, just then for a minute, I was thinking about the farm. And for a minute, I was there. And my baby was in my lap as plain as day. Yes, of course. You can. I can go back and live all those days over again. Why not? All I can say is, Emily, don't. But it's true, isn't it? I can go back and live there again? Some people have. They always come back here. Don't do it, Emily. Emily, don't. It's not what you think it be. But I won't live over a sad day. I'll choose a happy one. I'll choose the day I first knew that I loved George. Oh. No! Why should that be painful? You not only live it, but you have to watch yourself living it. Yes. And as you watch it, you see things that they down there don't ever see. You see the future. You know how it's going to end up afterwards. But is that painful? <laughs> That's not the only reason why you shouldn't do it, Emily. When you've been here longer, you'll see that. Our life here is to forget all that and think only of what is ahead and be ready for what is ahead. When you've been here longer, you'll understand. But Mother Gibbs, how can I ever forget that life? It's all I know. It's all I have. Oh, Emily, it isn't wise. Really, it isn't. But it's a thing I must find out for myself. I'll choose a happy day anyway. No. At least, choose an unimportant day. Choose the least important day of your life. It will be important enough. Well, then it can't be since I married, or since the baby was born. I can choose a birthday at least, can't I? I choose my 12th birthday. All right, it's 1899. All right, it's February the 11th, a Tuesday. Any particular time of day? Oh, I want the whole day. All right, we'll begin at dawn. Uh, you remember, it had been snowing for several days, and it had just stopped the night before. They'd begun clearing the roads. Uh, the sun is coming up. coming down in a minute to make breakfast. Will she? And your father, you remember, he'd been away for a couple of days. He was coming in on the early morning train. No. Going back to his college to make a speech in western New York at Clinton. There's Howie Newsom. And there's our policeman. But he's dead. He died. Whoa, Bessie. Morning, Bill. Morning, Howie. Yeah, all right. Been rescue the party. Darn near froze to death. Down by Polish town there. Got drunk and laid out in a snow drift. <laughs> Thought he wasn't bad when I shook him. There's Joe Crow. Morning, Howie. Morning, Mr. Ward. Morning, Joe. No, no. Children, Emily, Wally, time to get up. Mama, I'm here. Oh, how young Mama looks. I never knew Mama was ever that young. You can come and dress by the kitchen fire if you like, but hurry. Oh, morning, Mr. Newsom. Morning, Miss Webb. Oh, it's cold. Yeah, and Tim below by my barn, Miss Webb. Think of it. Keep yourself wrapped up. Yeah. Come on, Bessie. Mama, I can't find my blue hair ribbon anywhere. Just open your eyes, dear, that's all. I laid it out for you special on the dresser there. If it were snake, it bite you. Yes, yes. Good morning, Bill. Oh, morning, 
Mr. Webb. You're up early. Yeah, I've just been back to my old college in New York State. Uh, any problems here? I was called up real early this morning. Rescue a Polish fella. <laughs> Darn near froze to death, he did. Oh, I must get it in the paper. It not much. Morning, Mother. How did it go, Charles? Oh, well enough, I guess. I told him a few things. Uh, everything all right here? Yes, can't think of anything that's happened special. Been right cold. Howie Newsom says it's ten below over to his barn. Yes, well, it's colder than that at Hamilton College. Students' ears are falling off. It ain't Christian. <laughs> Does paper have any mistakes in it? Oh, none that I notice. Coffee's ready when you want it. Charles, don't forget, it's Emily's birthday. Did you remember to get her anything? There's something right here. Where's my girl? Where's my birthday girl? Oh, don't interrupt her now, Charles. She's slow enough as it is. You can see her at breakfast. Hurry up, children. Seven o'clock. Now, I don't want to call you again. I can't bear it. They're so young and beautiful. Why do they ever have to get old? Mama, I'm here. I'm grown up. I love you all. Everything. I can't look at everything hard enough. Can I go in? Morning, Mama. Well now, dear. And a very happy birthday to my girl. And many happy returns. Your surprise is waiting for you on the kitchen table. Oh, Mama, you shouldn't have. I can't. I can't. But birthday or no birthday, I want you to eat your breakfast good and slow. I want you to grow up to be a good, strong girl. Now, that in the blue paper is from your Aunt Carrie. And I reckon you can guess who brought the postcard album. Found it on the doorstep when I brought in the milk. George did. Must come over in the cold pretty early. Right nice of it. Oh, George, I'd forgotten that. Oh, chew that bacon good and slow. It'll help keep you warm on a cold day. Mama, just look at me one minute as though you really saw me. Fourteen years have gone by. I'm dead. You're a grandmother, Mama. I married George Gibbs, Mama. Wally's dead, too. His appendix burst on a camping trip to Crawford Notch. Don't you remember? We felt just terrible about it. But just for a minute, we're all together. Just for a minute, let's be happy. Now that in the yellow paper is something I found in the attic among your grandmother's things. You're old enough to wear it now, and I thought you'd like it. Oh, and this is from you. It's lovely, and it's just what I wanted. It's beautiful. Oh, I hoped you'd like it. Hunt it all over. Your Aunt Cora couldn't find one in Concord and had to send all the way to Boston. Oh, and Wally has something for you, too. He made it in manual training class, and he's very proud of it. Be sure you make a big fuss about it. Oh, and your father has a surprise for you. I don't know what it is myself. Shh, here he comes. Where's my girl? Where's my birthday girl? I can't! Realize. 
this life? Why don't they live it? Every, every minute? No. They're poets and saints, maybe they do some. on the feelings of those who, of those about to spin, waste time, as if you had a million years. Be always at the mercy of one self-centered passion or another. Yes, now you. And was that the better existence you wanted to get back to? Blindness, ignorance. That ain't the whole truth, and do you know it, Simon Stimson? Emily, look at that star. I forget its name. My boy Joel was a sailor. Knew them all. He'd sit on the porch even and tell them all by name. <laughs> yes, sir, it was. Wonders. The star's mighty good company. Yes, yes, it is. Look, there's one of them coming now. That's lucky. Ain't no time for him to be here. Mother Gibbs, it's George, dear. Just rest yourself. It's George. And my Joel knew the stars. He used to say it took millions of years for that little speck of life to get all the way down to Earth. It don't seem like a body could believe it. That's what he used to say. Millions of years. Goodness. That ain't no way to behave. He ought to be bold. Mother Gibbs, Miss Emily, they don't understand, do they? No, dear. They don't understand. Almost everybody's asleep in Grover's Corners. There's only a few lights on in town. One over at the depot where Shorty Hawkins just watched the Albany train go by. There's one over at the livery stable where some folks are setting up late and talking. It is cleared up. The stars are starting to do that old crisscross in the sky again. Scholars haven't settled the matter yet. They all seem to believe there are no living beings up there. It's only chalk and fire. Only this one is straining away. Straining away to make something of itself. The strain gets so great that everybody has to lay down and take a rest every 16 hours. Well, it's probably 11.30. Everybody in Grover's Corners is resting. And tomorrow is another day. You go home and get some rest, too.
good night.